Okay, record. Hey, welcome to Coffee Compiler Club. Um, we just stared at Burning Man pictures. I probably should have recorded them because they were kind of fun. Um, here today to talk about compilers and languages and runtimes and or Burning Man, which I went to and, and had a great time despite having all kinds of weird medical issues. Um, yeah. We go up on YouTube, everyone knows it, uh, done with the spiel, here to talk about whatever. So if people want to revisit Burning Man pictures for the video, let me know. I'll throw it up. And <laughs> something else going on. Okay. Oh, there's the link from Cameron for last week's. Okay. I, I'm going to do it anyhow and shortly and then be done if I can go find the, it again. And I'll just do it a quick run through for because the people who are watching this will have seen and uh, not seen i just did it for the group here hit the share button again how about now how about now brown cow there you go okay so here's burning man this year um these are all like well, three miles across i think something like that uh my camp was right about here that's center camp Here's the man, that's probably a mile and change. Here's the temple, a mile and a half. My mom died this summer, so I put a memorial to her in the temple, and we have a bunch of pictures from the temple burn. Um, don't worry about my mom. She was it was time. I, I grieved, it's done. Um, here's a, a sample piece of art. This is a traffic cone. Um, look at people for scale, uh, things like 50 feet tall or something. Uh, if I go back, I think. I'm guessing the cone is right about here based on the shadow dot. And each of the little marks you see on the playa soil here are almost surely some large piece of art, of which there are many hundreds of large pieces of art and thousands of smaller pieces scattered throughout this whole area. Um, it's just a huge amount of stuff. The, the cone was burned this year. Uh, Lisa and I went to watch the cone burn. That was very cool. Here are Earth moon mars and again people for scale they light up at night you can see them a mile or more from across the playa they're they're quite large and uh, and good landmarks okay. not to scale though yeah well you know oh well, there was a banana for scale piece of art at least took a bunch of pictures on the banana for scale was roughly the size of a standard 18 wheeler it's very 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 humorous um and had some snarky comment on it. It was very fun. Uh, yeah, people for scale. These things are probably a little shorter than the cone, so 40 feet or 30 feet tall or something. Uh, here's the sunken galleon, the galleon's captain's quarters heading up to the right. And here's the sea serpent heading over an arc above. There are treasure chests floating around with, you know, just broken up industrial glass, pretty things. And we have pictures underneath these arches, like people for scale again. The arch here is 15 feet or more in the air. The galleon had a real working uh, single eye stretch telescope on it and I don't know, all kinds of very authentic stuff in it. And somebody already asked, you know, where does this stuff go? And the answer is, of course, is that it comes for the week and goes. So it's out there for no more than a week, and then it's gone and will never show again. And that's the nature of Burning Man. All this art is ephemeral. You, you never get to see the same thing twice. Um, here's the Zeppelin during the day. Again, people for scale. It's a, you know, it's a basically a large truck body underneath. Um, it's probably 50 feet long or more, the, the Zeppelin body. And then... Uh, at night, they take off the white covering and it's got its outline is done in LED neon light rainbow that's very, very visible. Uh, it's an obvious marker. But of course, since it moves, you can't use it as a landmark to navigate around. There are several very large art cars that are very easy to identify at long ranges at night. At miles away, you can spot Luna or the Zeppelin here. Uh, but they move, so you can't use them to navigate at night. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, yeah. I have many other pictures from my wife and I. These are some public pictures that came out just as a taste of what Burning Man was like. It was um quite cold the start of the week. We go two weeks, quite cold at the beginning. Uh, pretty pretty reasonable temperature at the end, which means that it was 110 in the sun, 
uh, you know, high 90s in the shade during the hot parts, but still down to 50 at night. So you get a, a 50 to 60 degree temperature spread from night to day to night. It's it's a big spread, which is kind of fun. You're, you're wearing, you know, heavy coats at night and you're wearing the skimpiest bathing suit you can you can stand to wear during the day. So big, big shifts there. Okay. So I had a great time at Burning Man. I'm still like trying to get back onto non-Burning Man schedule. My driveway is still full of Burning Man gear to clear. They were getting it down. It's it's probably down a third of the things left to go, get hosed off and cleaned up, put away. We returned the van with no upcharges, so we cleaned it good. All that kind of stuff. Um, I don't have any set agenda. Anyone want to ask something or I'll talk something about recent simple work. Yeah, I was thinking about something recently. I made a change to a Rust thing and imported a package and the lock file showed that I had in fact imported a lot of packages when I thought that I had imported one package. And I realized looking at that, that the thing I actually needed was just one data structure and it was a dependency of the dependency. And I was able to just grab the thing that was too deeper and right. not have the giant tar, right. you know, hairball. And it made me think about the fact that I got value from the fact that there was a lock file that had essentially conclusions that came out of the dependency graph calculator. Right. Why do I not have an equivalent of the lock file that says, here is a bunch of things that were learned by the compiler that I can check into my code base. And then when I make a small change, if it suddenly cascades a lot of places, like it might be interesting to have a file that comes out that says, here is every call site that happened in this binary and whether that call site ended up being inlined monomorphic, dimorphic, quadmorphic, megamorphic. Was well, this a direct call? Was this right. an indirect call? And now I make a small change and suddenly a thousand call sites all went megamorphic. And you're like, wait a second, what did I just do that Wait, massively yeah. changed the performance properties of my thing that I and might I notice because I'm looking at a diff and the diff is showing me here's a bunch of things that changed. Like, is there anyone who's done, let's dump out interesting text files that can be checked into the repository so I can know, have I really changed what my code means, even though I've only made a small change to my code? So a lot of things- Or is this just a crazy idea? No, well, it's not crazy, except that you, you, you have, if you have an, a compiler artifact, then you have some way to repeatedly build it then you have a, a second compiler artifact because you've modified the source. Effectively, you have a dot .o from the first compile and a dot .o from the second compile. You're going to look at the difference in the two dot .os. I generally say, since you've generated the first dot .o and you've generated the second dot .o, you don't check them in. You just generate them. And then you run the diff on the two dot .os. And now, you want to, now it's a tooling and ease of use and quality of implementation issue that says, pre the diff, post the diff, tell me what happened to the dot .os as opposed to I needed to check something in. Like check-in is like a thing that you do on things that you make so your work effort doesn't get lost. Whereas a .o is just like, I pressed a button on the compiler and he spat out a, a, an analysis. And he put some of that analysis in the .o, but he could put more analysis in the .o. He could say things like, I inlined this and I didn't inline that. So on. So .o yeah. is like a record from a random number generator. Well, uh, th there's no uh, reusing just in time. Yeah, throw in the link, Matt. Th there's no there's no requirement that a dot o only contain obtuse shit. Like it contains the 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 x eighty six binary bits that you threw together. Okay, great. That, but it, it does all other kind of analysis is floating around. You could dump that out in the dot o. There's no reason to throw it away other than, you know, bulk. And, and the other piece of this, of course, is it's very sensitive. You're like, hey, this went monomorphic and that and this and that. But a lot of these things are like, I inline 15 layers deep here, but not over here for whatever reason. And then the decision changed when you touch something. 
a lot of the heuristics are very sensitive, fragile, chaotic. Chaotic's a good one, like some chaos theory chaotic, meaning a minor change in your part may make a large change in the actual layout of who did what with also being only a minor change in performance. So I, I know in the land of supercomputer vectorizing guys, they went really hard down the path of trying to have the compiler's vectorizing knowledge exported as part of the things you got out of the .o so that when you hacked your loop nest and it failed to vectorize on your supercomputer, so performance dropped by three orders of magnitude and became basically broken. Um, you, know, you didn't throw a compiler error, but failed to vectorize and a giant thing on a giant super is basically death. So they want to know why. Why did the compiler fail to vectorize this? Well, the compiler had an analysis that didn't work when you made a minor tweak, but it worked beforehand. Now figure out why your minor tweak tweak the compiler's analysis. But there are other things that might be useful. So like one example, we talked about with AA a long time ago that it might be interesting to have types where you don't actually define the type anywhere. I mean, AA is all like inferring types. It's all inferred. All I take inferred. it in at the top of the function, but I give it a name and it's got a name as it goes through, but there's no point where I say, here's all the constraints that this named type means. Oh yeah, that's easy. And do. the compiler learns what that right. named type means, even right. though you didn't tell the compiler what that named type means. Yes, I can do that. If you have something that's dumping out an object that says, here is what I inferred this type to mean. Yeah, right, okay. Suddenly I, I make right. a change and it propagates all the way up to the top. And it's like, oh, yeah. if I've got, say, a bunch of web endpoints, and at the very top of the web endpoint, I say, parse the JSON object into this type. And now, super deep down, I've tried to access a field that yeah. percolates back up and had to have been in the JSON object that was passed in in the first place. Right. I could see a change that's like, oh, you changed your web API when you made this change. Did you mean to actually change your public facing web API? API? Right. And the way we enforce that now in most of the products I've looked at is there's some super strict definition of exactly what's in the web API. Right. And I make right. my change and I have to update that thing so that I'll be able to access the field down here. Right. But it's actually a much nicer workflow to just make the change down here and be informed when you look at the diff. Oh these types along the path changed. And here's all the derived information about what these types look like. And you can look at those as a reference as a human who would like to look at these named types and know what's in them. Well, but also, you don't types. have to constantly be updating that code right. yourself because that's really just a derived artifact, isn't right. it? Right. This is like every, every IDE's language server ever, right? Mm -hmm. I want to infer the type. I want to hover the mouse and tell me the inferred type. So yes, but explaining things in in typically in the manner will will be a set of constraints. So you have to figure out what what it what it really mean meant by that. Yeah, I'm yeah. not currently tracking where all the constraints come from. I give you the final constrained results. It's all unification for AA. So it's just I unify the seven these following things. Yeah. Yes. And now you have this type because of unification. Okay. What things went into that unification? Well, fingers run everywhere in uses. So you get all kinds of weirdly, wildly indirect things. Hmm. Now you can put a name on that. And if wherever you use that name, AA will tell you what that type got inferred to from all those use points. But each of the types at each use point got its own, you know, types from unification that came from other places. And pretty soon you get all kinds of weird constraints everywhere. I mean, I've, I've hit that a bunch in my tiny little AA test cases. You pick up constraints from odd places all the time. Now, can you explain where they came from? What's a good way? What's a good way to explore where these types came from? Mm -hmm. Right. I, mean, I feel like the first order is just spitting out what the types are at yeah. different places. Yeah. So you put a name in. And so I have a thing and I'm like, at this point, I have this Lambda function that takes an yeah. argument. Yeah. I'm not actually super clear what's there. Yeah, right. I, I'm going to give it a name and run yeah. the compiler and it's going to tell me here's all the constraints on this 
point. So, so when I was debugging these things in, in a pure functional language in the past, I typically went through and said, I think this ought to be X and I'm confused. So I put a type assertion in that said, your type is X. And then the compiler would say, well, no, you fail again. But now that this is supposed to be an X, I'll change my error message to report some other failure elsewhere. Yeah, I've had that before where I'm like, yeah. okay, this is a complex structured type. And I'm like, assert it's an int. And it's like, oh, well, it can't be an int. It has to be this thing. And it's like, well, why did you tell me you couldn't derive what it was? But if I tell you it's an int, you say it yeah. can't be an int. It has to be this exact thing. Well, it would tell me what it, it would tell me I can't make a blah, blah, blah as a blah, 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 where these two blah, blah, blahs are these giant, enormous types that make no sense. They're like huge things. And there's no names on them. There's all the complete broken down to the fullest minor detail. OK, fine. So now you put a, a name for the type as an assertion. Here, the type is called capital P Persian, which I have this hard definition for right here. Then it comes back through and gives me a new error that says, blah, 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 with Persians here and Persians there, and it's failing. But it, it shrank the type, and it moved the error point to some other place where I was passing in a person plus plus, and I, I should only be passing in a person or something. I don't know. You know who knows, right? I, I missed a level of indirection. I added a level of indirection. Fine. And then two or three rounds of that usually narrowed it down to, and here's where I I did the wrong thing. I should have pulled a, 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 a listiness out, or flattened a listiness, or added a list of something stupid. I, I I I curried, took free currying by accident. And so instead of passing uh, the evaluation of a function, I passed the function missing an argument, which everyone was all good with. And they just passed along the function missing argument instead of the function result until I asked for the result. And they were like, this isn't a result. This is a function missing an argument. But I applied this argument you asked for to this and it doesn't work. <laughs> what? Fine. So there's something to do there with, yeah, with uh, improvements on how you diagnose these complex functional programming languages. Well, to me, it wasn't just about the debugging experience. It was also about the code review experience. Uh, I'm looking at somebody else's change. Uh -huh. uh. I may want it to be super obvious if one of the core types that's passed around all over the place changed at all. And I'm like, uh, I think you're violating some isolation thing. <clears throat> because this core type has changed what the type of this thing is in 700 places. Maybe you should do something to keep you a little bit more isolated where you add your little extra field, but you also remove your little extra field before you returned it. And now you just have a type that is a slightly different type in your object, in your class, in your module. Right. Rather than having this thing that percolates out. Um, oh, particularly say... in Rust, types manage to propagate to weird places where you change yeah. your thing and it's suddenly recompiling some package that's super far away. And you're like, but why did this type <laughs> thing? Like, what do you mean you're recompiling hash map? <laughs> yeah, I, this is a Rust thing. I don't know. I have had weird, like Java will do that on me. I'll change something and he, he lights up and instead so of being, yeah. Java never bugged me as much when you make a small change that really changes the way the compiler compiles things. Because well, it's Java usually C. doing that on runtime and I don't need to like make a bunch of changes to my code in a bunch of places. I don't know about Java C. I, will, I would hack something or pick up something and suddenly he'd, he'd decide he had to go rebuild everybody and I don't know why. Fine. Um, but one of the things I was dealing with recently was, you know, I basically spent an entire day on plumbing a thing yeah. because it was like at the input over here, I need one extra field. Right. And in the output over here, I need the field, but it goes through like a whole okay. bunch of different stuff. Yeah. Okay. And suddenly it's like, oh, well, this is a new type that's got a new shape because it's got a new field, which means this type is a new shape, which means this type is a new shape, which means this type is a new so shape, which means this type is a new shape. propagating the field through these other objects. Like when I usually, when I'm, it's time to add a field, somewhere here, I don't pass it through other things automatically. If I have to pass, this field has to come from there. I go there and I add the field. This field now has to come from over there. I go over there and add the field. I'm manually adding it. I don't pick up a free field installed in data structures all along. 
and you say you are. So like, like the JSON one is weird to me already because JSON has no form and structure or whatever. So I have a, a, a JSON schema I'm parsing to. And you say, I want to add a field down here. First off, it went to some other structure and needed to be added there. And you say that was some sort of automated thing doing that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not clear where that came from. Yeah, so the usual pattern is you have some endpoint and the JSON has like a type field at the top. Okay. I want to do one of seven jobs and the dispatch yeah. field gets dispatched in the first function. That's like, let me just look at this thing and then pass whatever the JSON right. object is through. Right. Um, so the type that you're getting from my, here's my endpoint for RPCs takes this terrible type. That's like the union of all the fields of all the possible right. RPCs. Right. And then at the next layer, you have a much smaller type that's like, okay, here's only the fields that this particular RPC type takes. Right. And then that one's got a thing that splits it up and is like, okay, here's the actual like six or seven tiny objects that go call the microservices that care about those things and get the responses back. And then it builds a response, which it then hands up, which then the router right. takes that response and returns it. Right. And like the ultimate type that is taken and returned by the router is a really terrible type. Right. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, you know, void star by any other name. Just um give it up. But I mean, you know, I don't know. Cores communicating channel, communicating processes kind of thing, strongly typed channel communications. Yeah, right. to some point you want some of the channels to be strongly typed and you want some of the channels to just be like, I don't care, you figure. Like any, you have, you have go some, ahead. You have, you have some void star thing you want to sort it. It's like you're going from an untyped space, the serialized JSON wad, into a type space, and somewhere along the way, the guy, one of the directions, wants to enforce that he sees a new field or he handles a new field coming out of his right. machine. Because you want to blow up immediately. If someone gives you a shape that you can't accept, you don't yeah. want to do some work and yeah. then find out that you. Can't took do. in the shape that you can't accept. And now you have to undo whatever that work was. So at some point, you want to blow up immediately and be like, you gave right. me garbage. No. Right. So at some point you have a line where you went from I'm unstructured text wad to I'm strongly typed. Right. And usually yeah. what I find is you end up just duplicating work that you've got your block of work that operates on that shape. And yeah. then you update your shape definition at the front to be able to detect those things. And they just end up being two independent pieces of code that have to match. Well, and it's yeah, like, it's right, but what like I'm doing that. here is just type, I'm moving all the constraints from the bottom to the front. That's what my type system does for me. Uh, here's Matt trying to say session types, which actually sounds like the right thing about Yeah, uh, session types for typing, but also this problem you mentioned, you, you have this problem when you have to modify two programs, right? Yeah, because you kind of have a client program and you have a server program. So there is also some solution to that. It's called choreographic programming. When you basically write your server and client application as one application, and then they share the same type system. And then you are able to synchronize the changes you have made to the client with the changes you made to the server. It's right. relatively new, but that seems to be at least along those lines. See, in the land of H2O, it was all peer-to-peer. -peer. Everyone was both client and server. We invented protocols for structures the first time we saw some Java structure. And that was, and then everyone agreed on that in the cluster. And we didn't have this issue per se. If you went in and hacked a Java structure, well, you made a new Java class. And that basically showed up as a new Java class from the server's point of view. With all But everyone those. was running the same jar, right? Well, no, that's what I'm saying. If you, if you win, yes, everyone starts with the same. Were job. you building those classes dynamically at yes. runtime based on what you found in the CSV files or? Well, we weren't, but we could. Like, like we took it from a jar, but it was the first person to see a class file he's never seen before, explained what it looked like to everybody else. And then they all agreed on the networking handshake protocols to deal with that class. So there was a, you know, there was a one time I got a thing. I don't know what it is. I mean, I've never seen it before. So I, I hit the reflection button on it and I, I count all the fields and I look at it. And then I run off to 
the the peer to peer communication around the cluster and say, hey, has anyone seen this before? And somebody wins or or everyone loses, and then the the winner says, okay. Then he comes up with a serialization protocol based on very straightforward whatever how the fields looked, and everyone agreed, okay, this is the serialization protocol for the struct, and it's a new struct ever before seen. So you can't rename it, but you can make a new one that had a different name. You know, I have person version one and person version two and Nary the Twain shall meet. We didn't do things where we dynamically took a person version one and then added a new field to it, but we could totally have made an object from a CSV file. That was, that was fine. I don't care where the class file came from. I'll, I'll turn it and I'll give you a serialization program. protocol that's custom for it. But that was because I'm both client and server. So there was no handshakey per se, or everyone handshaked instantly upon discovery. But you've never found a situation where it's particularly useful to sort of take all the kinds of things that language servers know and diff them here. between I did two a, versions. I mean, I did a bunch of client server things that were really client server, and I usually hacked both sides. And I often tried to arrange that they sucked from a common definition place. Well, one of the things Aaron's describing is the difference between a point in time analysis, which is what tools are really good at, and diffing to point in time analysis. In other words, keeping some historical data and being smart enough to say, by the way, you may not have noticed, but you know, 10 levels down in your implicit imports you just picked up spring and the entire internet came with it yes right like and, and that is useful so having having static analysis that says i'm going to look at this point in time is useful but it's also useful to have some warnings when things change that are kind of outside the scope of the instant like you have to have historical data to compare to to do that, if you will. So uh, when doing NPM things, I would just look at the count of imported, I don't say jars or classes, whatever, imported modules. Mm -hmm. And when it jumps substantially, I, I would work backwards. But I, I eyeballed that one. Hey, I've got a thousand. Right, but that oh, was an today. easy jump to detect because you have a lock file that has the list of all of the transitive dependencies. Well, the history I I took by saying, Yesterday I ran this. I had a thousand. Today I run it. I get two thousand imports. Uh, what did I do? That you know, twitchy, twitchy. Now go work backwards or on my on my diffs. I didn't have a. Well, I did. I mean, you go to npm and he says, and here's the pile you got, and and then I could take it from yesterday's pile and diff the two piles. That was exactly. But that was a okay. That was a log of what the imports were. Right, and I think it would be convenient to be able to diff a thing like. Here is the list of all of the call sites in your program. Are they static calls or are they indirect calls? So, so you're talking jitting or are you talking like more source time? code time? I think so. One of yeah, the things... my assumption is this is ahead of time yeah. compile. Okay. Yeah. Years years ago, I worked on an IDE that um, we actually kept all the all the call sites had UIDs. So basically, each each thing got assigned a UID, so the call sites would actually were persistently store the UIDs they were dependent on. So that if data change, if code changed over time and you missed some updates, you could actually kind of refactor asynchronously by automatically refactor asynchronously by seeing, oh, you know, I used to depend on something and they renamed it. They shipped me a new version of it. I need to automatically, you know, potentially, you know, refactor to use the new name so i i guess i was always interested in the reverse where this thing over here is alive because i have a use over here i hacked the code that was using it it quit using it and then so there is actually something like that for c plus plus recently released it's called multiplier so what it does is exactly it saves all of the build artifacts into database and then those artifacts are available for query. It's actually used for code auditing because you may want to see if there is some new data flow that has been introduced in the application by a change in the patch. So that, that's one of the applications. Right, but I tend to find diffing binaries hard and diffing textual descriptions of what happened at call sites less hard. Right. 
It it starts from the abstract syntax tree, so it saves it saves, it saves tokens, AST nodes, and intermediate representations. So it's like from multiple levels to what I understand. So it does have some semantic understanding, which is interesting, going beyond text. I've certainly done games where I've talked to people who also do these games. In the JIT, where you turn on the flags, he says, I've JITed this code, and here's my inlining decision tree. Got sped out as a text string. And then, you know, yesterday's version, I got this inline decision tree, and today's version, I get that inline decision tree, and some crucial inlining didn't happen, and my performance fell by 10x, and why did it not happen? Uh, but I didn't know it was very... You had to be kind of an expert in what it meant to read those and understand them. This is one of the things with about your, your, your comment about, hey, I, I chose this inlining strategy and I monomorphize that and I bimorphize this and yada, yada, whatever. You kind of have to be an expert on what's going on there to make use of that data, which maybe that's okay. Maybe just give it up and say, for experts, if you want to know what's going on, you can do this. Or you let people pick what they care about. Like maybe the default version is you don't spit out this file at all. And if someone says, hey, can you spit out all of the types that you've inferred at the yeah. locations that you've inferred them? Right. Oh, that'd be big. That's a big, I have that dump for debugging purposes, of course. It gets big. And kind of gets hard to read on anything that's beyond tiny. Maybe. Even if you only dump it for named types. Well, that would be a restriction. Only dump it for, you said everything everywhere. Okay. Here yeah, everything up. everywhere is going to be big, and some of those types are likely to be nasty. Yes, and and uh, the type printer is pretty smart. He, he'll he'll take all the shareables and define them once you know more upfront and share them again. And way down the bottom, you're looking at this variable and it has type Q. What's Q? Okay, Q is a function from an A B arrow X struct Y Z and T and U and X and blah blah blah. And you have to keep finding the the recursive communication parts, and that's because you didn't put a useful name on any of the types, so they're just A, B, C, D, said. I mean, that was the old Ida Pro game, is you let the decompiler generate stuff for you, and then as you figure out what stuff is, you give it names, and oh. it ends up being a little bit like solving a Sudoku. At the very beginning, yeah, okay. it's hard to figure out what's going on at all. Right. And then never, you never... suddenly have this cascade of, you can basically read the code. Right. Yeah, I never, I never played the game, but I did watch Java reverse compilers gradually get better and better until suddenly eh, a reasonable job came out. No comment. But the idea of, you know, you look at the thing and there's one particular spot that's really nasty, so you give that one a name and suddenly yeah, the whole file right. gets much smaller. Think, things start cleaning up. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, randomly people showing up. And usually I like vaguely know where I want to put the names. You know, if I've got my giant router type right. and I say, okay, I'm going to give a name to the 17 things that it can be yeah. routed to. Right, right. Well, now everything downstream from those gets stopped at the name and yeah, everything name, upstream of those name. is just like, it's the yeah. or of the 17 names because you gave names to the 17 right. things. Yeah, when I was doing a similar game with, uh, Elm and Haskell things. When I ran into situations, I just started putting names to types on things. And uh, and then the error messages cleaned up and I had these better names for things. And yes, I did that manually. But in Elm, can you give a type a name without defining the type explicitly? Yeah, you, you give it a, a type that's uh, uh, generic, like completely unspecified. It's a free variable. It's like a list, uh, a map is a function from A to B in a collection of A's. Well, what's A? It's just a generic type. So I throw a generic type name down for this variable. And then I had to use the type name wherever I wanted to expect it to be used. And then he would come along later and tell me what it was. And then if I could force it, I would say, oh, you're a known to be a float. He would say type error. And then he would give me the error message, the other type. He said, I'd inferred this type, but it's not a float. And I would say, oh, cop copy and paste, slap it down. Let me but know if it changes again. But specifying types doesn't, does it, um, if it's so useful, why don't you require it? So, well, because there's times <laughs> where it, it's not like, like mm. the inference is clear and obvious and, and or never fails. So I don't care. I'm just moving on. Mm. 
I mean, that's the whole point of doing inference in the first place. Why does Java, why did Java pick up the var or C's auto? It's because sometimes I don't want to type stack of generic hash map of string, comma, integer, comma, blah, 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 blah. You know, fuck it. We all know what's going on here. I just want to use the type in place. Yeah. I don't need to be thing T equals thing colon colon new thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How many times? I can just be it? like no. auto T equals, equals thing colon thing. colon new. Right. Done. Now I'm all for type inference, but then there's a time and a place where you have to unwind and say, hey, help me out here. There is also this interesting counterpoint you sometimes hear from dependently typed languages community like Tone or Matt Bright is that you can you should actually be typing types up front, and that's the specification, and that's the important part, and that's what human readers are going to read. And the incidental artifact that can be easily inferred is code. Because if you have a good enough type system, then that trivial and obvious part is obviously going to be just automatically produced. So that's no reason to type that. Yeah, that's, that's what AI is just for, true. right? And, oh. Abstract interpretation, of course, yes. I have usually found that that is wrong. I, I've worked in systems where they seem to try to encode all of the constraints in the type system and yeah. be like, aha, you can't make these very large classes of errors because the type system won't let you because I've got 17 different types for each thing. And I parse my event into unvalidated event, and then I validate it, and that returns validated event. And now I have 17 different types that all have almost the identical shape, because at each step of my data pipeline, it took a type, and there's a new type. And, and the, 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 the hardness Then can't... the day comes where you need to add a field, and suddenly you have to plumb it through, because after each function, there's a new type, because there's a function from type A to type B to type C to type D to type E. Not, and not to mention the just types. Inserting a new field, I have to insert a new waterfall. Yeah, and that that is the the reason to not put in type inferencing or uh, not put in names for types. I would say it's a uh, it's a problem how to specify. Uh, so one one of the problems are on describe that the the types would become huge. It's an option a feeder of something in each each type container encodes some type information that doesn't come comes with the type that that would make them composable. But the types become become unwieldy. So. Well, I think still you have to think of types as code and that you have to maintain and engineer. So for example, you wouldn't be passing a hash map from a string to an int everywhere in the new compiler, at some point you would be passing a symbol table, which is just a simple concrete type. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's only fair if we think of types exactly as the code that we have to engineer with the usual software engineering advice about modularity and cohesion. Hmm. Hard. Certainly naming types is useful. Of course, but uh, would you rather name it with the, all the containers it wants? So it's an option of either of lists of option of either of some some possible right. type specification, and th that that becomes cumbersome. And so you want that to see it, but you want to to be inferred. So, but there is a limit. Uh, there is a limit on on how much uh, the the inference uh, can infer. So, no, I, I think the inference can go all the way. It's just a matter of, I don't, if I, if I have decided I have this thing that I'm calling a symbol table and I don't tell you what type it is, but I use it in a bunch of places and the compiler infers, that's great. Now the compiler infers at a different place, another type, which is identical to symbol table, but I didn't use the word symbol table on it. Do I? Pretty printed as a symbol table, or do I give you the expanded? It's this is the type, you know. Here's that's, the whole thing. that's the easy version. Uh, the, if the compiler has to infer the 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 whole option of either of lists, there is a upper bound of how much containers containers, if you will, can infer. So there is a, and yes, there is a there is a problem there. Okay, I'm, I'm missing something. But I think maybe we should have a language jargon problem. Mm. Like, yeah. I, I'm not expecting a compiler 
that looks at the code for hash map to infer that the name of the type should be hash map. No, 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 no. We are talking. We are talking about different things. So, okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Do you want to try it again? I'm, I'm mm. missing something. Mm. Like mm. about it's I about the... my hash map to be a hash map from A's to B's. Right. Mm. I could look at a call site and say, ah, what happened here is you instantiated a hash map from string to int. Right. Yes. It's not just going to say I... you instantiated a hash map from A to B. Right, right. No, no, that one, the... that one totally makes sense. However, this I, is, the, I this is the easy. If it has to infer that A is an option of list of something, of something, of something, right. of something, right. there is an upper, upper bound of how much the types become too big to, to be inferred. They mm -hmm. could mean a lot of things. So what's yes. the upper bound? I don't understand why there would so, be this like a theoretical question. There's no uh, upper bound. So there, there, there is a decidability on how much. Uh, uh, okay, that gets into whether you're dependent types or not, which uh, no, be. no, it, it's uh, the the types before. Uh, let's let's say if if I will butcher it up, the types rank uh, rank and polymorphism. So the rank tree. Uh, rank, uh, the rank three is maybe the upper bound that's that's beyond it becomes undecidable. So it's a container inside a container inside a fully saturated type of option of list of person. So this is the upper bound of the rank n types that can be inferred decide, uh, that is decisible. So that is rank, rank certain, polymorphism is not decidable. But it's it a certain Henry right? Milner algorithm rank does n. not care uh, here and would happily certain. go as deep as you like. But but that's because I'm I'm limited to using Henry Milner using what I'm doing. So so yeah. if you go outside Henry Milner at... and you say I'm System F or something more exotic, so yes, and a typey thing. It's a rank and rank and polymorphism. So let me let me look it up and I will yeah, okay. paste some. Yeah 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 yeah. So like I said, Henry Milner does not care, but it's it's Henry Milner. And it's not. It's not some of the more fancier stuff. All right. We we all we we all done with this one. So I have my my. Yeah, it sounds like the answer I'm getting back is people do believe that storing information over time so you can diff what changed has value. It, it it's happened. No it, one's found a useful tool for storing compiler output over time. Right, but... it, it's happened. Like like I said, the 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 HPC vectorizing guys played this game really hard for a while. But it clearly hasn't become popular in the way that like language servers have become hugely popular right, to just exactly. mouse over a thing and have it say, right. this is what I think the type is. Right, right. And if you're looking for a diff between yesterday and today, I don't have an easy way to do that except like pop up two copies of IntelliJ on two different workspaces and stare at the, you know, mark one eyeball, the two different pop-ups, right? Yeah, what I'd, what I'd say too is that you know, in software development over time, there are two trends that seem very evident. One is that everything should be text. Yeah. I'm not arguing as good or bad. I'm just telling you that it's won out over the years, right? Every attempt that to do has surprised stuff. me, but I agree with the statement. I, yeah. And the other one is that um, only the now matters, right? So there's no, there's no history. Like you can go into a version control system and da da da, but like basically all the tools are built to deal only with the image that's currently in your project directory right. and you, fuck everything else. You don't want to go backwards mm -hmm. in time and unwind somebody's big effort to say, but but I'll go backwards to peak and say, how did I get here and why? But I'm not just saying, oh, I worked for two months, throw it all away, back up. Go forward again over this way. Oh, come back over here. And in fact, I do that personally. That happens to me fairly often, but it's not a thing I like to do in the tooling. Yeah, it doesn't help. It's gotten better over the years. I say Git branches are, are better. Yeah, I've thrown out branches about... a lot. I can't remember a time when the company just rewound main by a significant time. Seen, right, exactly, exactly. So my problem here is I do some interesting, complicated change to the type system I think is working and I shove it to main. And I carry on a while, and then I realize it's fundamentally flawed from back here. Okay, now my options are unwind other things that happened that were good and useful I want to keep along with this nasty type change and roll forward again and trying to reapply. Or 
I fixed my bug and then this space in the history was broken if you ever saw the following test case that I didn't come across until later. Crap, I'm doing that in simple all the time. We suddenly discovered that like, I don't know, two days ago, I figured out that simple was not handling the empty statement. It would simply crash on the empty statement. Stupidly. Yeah, You're no just like reason. semicolon, semicolon, and it's like, no? Yeah, yeah, you'd be, no one ever ran that test case. So suddenly someone ran the test case accidentally out of the fuzzer and in and, and a different way. It didn't look like that. It looked like struct name S0 of struct definition, which does not require a semicolon, then a semicolon. Now it had an empty statement. And then he crashed. It's like, what? Yank the semicolon, all worked. Add the semicolon, crash. Wait a minute. Okay, empty. Still statement. think that should be a lint error, but probably not a compiler crash. No, no. But but the point is, is that I've had statements in simple since like chapter three or four or something. You know, so so the last ten chapters, last three months, six months, this has slipped under the radar. Okay, fine. Now, when you fix it, do you go fix it in each of the ten prior history chapters? You just say. If any time you, you're working your compiler and you get up to chapter three or chapter four and you try the empty statement, you're going to crash. Jeez. Fine. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I read the conversations around it. And it's I, I kind of wonder if you want to almost like introduce a note back in the old chapter and say, by the way, there's a bug here. And we're going to talk about how that bug got in, how yes. we found it, and how maybe we could have avoided it. Yeah, that, but, the, yes. There, there is a history of building the the language compiler. This is only a year old project, not even a year old project. That that's still fairly fresh in people's minds. That we basically agree it would be useful to go backport the node as opposed to backport the fix. This is broken here. We didn't catch it till chapter X. I mean, oh. that's the thing that drove me crazy about my math classes. Is you would show up and they'd be like, "Here is the way you solve this problem as descended from heaven," and you're like. Right, but how did you get there? <laughs> like, well, back in the 60s, I get that this is the paved road, before. but what was the hacking your way through the jungle with the machete that led to this path that you then decided to pave? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, if exactly. I'm going to do anything new, I need to understand the machete jungle path, so not claimed, just the paved road. I claim the major thing that's missing in Simple right now is somebody other than me that can uh, uh, debug because there is a series of things I do as Cliff's internal tribal knowledge on how to debug bugs. They're very straightforward. If you don't know them, you'll be really hard pressed to guess them. With them, you have these tools that magically take apart the optimizer at these places and narrow binary search quickly down to, and here the bug was happened. Okay, you know, it's like I need to do a debugging session as a live stream and include it in the simple docs. Here's how you debug. That was actually one of the useful things we did at university is the professor would do debugging sessions. Do do live debugging sessions? I did. Yeah. He would just stand up and be like, someone who turned in this homework and I've anonymized the homework. So there's no identifying things right. here. Right. We as a class are going to take it from the thing that was turned in to a thing that would have actually gotten the points on the homework. Right. That's a good idea. And what you realized was that the professor who'd been doing this for 30 years didn't really make fewer mistakes than any of the students in the class. He yes. just, the cycle time of, I did this thing, oh, that was wrong, here's how I fix it, now I fixed it, was yes. 12 seconds instead of 12 hours. Right. This is my, this is one of the big discoveries I did at Sun when I, when I was getting told to, whatever, getting told bad things about me. I went through and did the math and discovered that I was, on average, the same count of bugs but I produced 10x more code. So 10x more bugs because I had 10x more code. And also I was much faster at tracking and nailing everyone's bugs, including my own. And there are some tricks to debugging these bugs that you know make it plausible. So like, yeah, I was same average bug rate per line of code, just a lot more code and then a lot more fast on fixing. But your development style relies on those debugging skills. It does. It totally like happens. I've seen in a lot of the sea of nodes stuff, it yeah. needs to be monotonically making progress. Yes. I and when I look at it and it's like, well, how do you know that you're monotonically making progress? 
Ah. And the answer is, well, if you're not, that's a bug, so go debug it. Yes. Oh, that one that one's easy. Like there's the giant assert. You know, we we so so here's a question for for we have this small crowd here. I can switch to a live debugging session I just did this morning and repeat it, finding and fixing whatever stupid bug was running around. And and most of these bugs are are the reported by by Zmilia, um because he does the the heavy duty fuzzer runs and he corrects the fuzzer and I'm letting him do that. So very helpful. Things that I catch from my internal search never make it onto the Discord or the GitHub because pre-push testing pops them right out. So one of my things, of course, is I do ah, aggressive pre-push testing. Like, like people do, fine. So those don't show up. But when you get something that shows up, it got past my testing, I usually add a test case and then I go and debug it. So we, we can do this. Hmm. A lot of them. Ask questions while I sort this around and figure out what I'm going to do or deal or conversation. And I'm going to roll back some kind of recent fix and then show you where it came from and how to fix it. Like, here's one. Yes, let's see if I can go find the fix for that one and unwind and re-find re it. Uh, da, 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 da. And masking narrows in. So that's even more recent. Oh, it's easy. It's a little subtle. What well, we can do this one's even even simpler and even more subtle. So the more subtle is not good, but simpler is. A lot of these things have this this uh, a funny funny issue that the the code involved is very simple, and also subtle. So it's hard to, to diagnose things. So I undid a, a, a few lines of code and immediately get a crash now. So let me go and pull up IntelliJ. Let me attempt to share it and then do font things with it. Uh, hello, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Thank you, share, find IntelliJ. That looks like IntelliJ. Let me find view. What's a bond things of you to a kill? Where are you hiding view? Parents, zoom, 200%. Okay, is that readable? Let me yes. shrink. Looks a little wide, kind of readable. Okay. So, uh, where did I go here? Zamila reports the following thing, which let me find the correct one. One of these, oh, I got I have the test here. So I ran this thing in my uh, not visible to you Emacs, which instantly pops up this test, test while you ate. Let's go find that. Chapter 14 test. So uh, this code, this code fails. Now the nearby code works. So I, I wrote the first test thinking, oh, this should be a good, useful test. It's going to work. And I wrote it and I fixed it. I'll quit that. Thank you. Move over here. And then uh, Zemilia ran the second one and then it failed. So, so what's going on here? So new in chapter 14 is narrowed ints. And like C everywhere, I am silently narrowing ints, which means I just truncate. Um, so this is an unsigned, B is an unsigned eight byte. It's a byte. And I put 123 in, no problem. I add 456. Upon getting the assignment, it's supposed to silently truncate back to a byte, which means that the, the, the expected result is a constant folded 67. Okay, that worked. Then along came this test, which the expected result is you got a loop that runs forever because B is never zero. Fine, it's a stupid test but the output shouldn't crash. And instead, it's going to, let's see, it's better crash, ha ha ha, crash, yeah, here you go. I put a breakpoint at runtime error. Okay, so if I have tests that normally are expected to fail, this breakpoint will stop me. There's very few of them, so I typically leave it set, so I get an immediate hit. I hit a breakpoint that said I have an error. The error message is type int is not of declared type U8. Ah, what the hell? So going back to my test here, 
the declare type is U8. Obviously, this math, this math, B plus 456, widens to an int, and it's an int type assigned to uh, a byte. It must truncate. And in theory, I'm supposed to silently truncate this. Why did I not silently truncate? So what happened here? So this is a bug. I'm expecting to silently truncate. It widens rather than wrapping right there? <laughs> well, OK, so so the, I guess the... that's true. If the thing out was the destination was an in 64, I wouldn't want it to wrap and then be assigned to the N64. So, that would so totally be wrong. The, the simple specs here are stupid because that's not the goal of the language. The goal of the language is to be easy to compile and obvious what's going on. Okay, the spec is when you assign to a narrowed variable, to a narrowed int variable, an int thing to a narrowed int value, it silently truncates. When you load from that thing, it's going to silently widen to a full 64 using the appropriate sign extension rules. And then do the math as in 64 with sign two's complement overflow. So that's the semantics. Love them or hate them. Fine. So my expectation here is this value will be force truncated with no effort at all, with no code, into a U8. Fine. Here it will be zero extended to 64 bits. Add 456, no overflow happens. Then it should truncate again when an assignment here. Um, and then the code that you generate has a fee of a loop of it takes a 123 initial value and just loops himself around adding 456 and truncating. That's what you expect to see. That's the optimized generated code. Now the program obviously runs forever. I mean, it's a stupid program, but should just add 456 and truncate. Okay, great. What? Why did I get here? Well, here's my expression assignment guy. Let's start up here. Expression assignment. Looking for some name, that's just an error. Oh, type of a name if you're declaring a new thing. Oops. Type of a name if you're doing with an expression or you're reassigning or you just computed an expression. So this is this is where I'm at in the parser. He looks for a type. He turns out he gets something, type integer T U8, but maybe he got the, the this is T gets modified down below. So I, I'm suspicious about T. I got my name B. Okay. And then I do, uh, I, I don't get a semicolon right away. I get an expression. I'm going to parse the expression and then find my semicolon. Then I'm going to do update versus uh, redefine. Then there's auto widen floats and auto narrow ints. And then there is a, a uh, well, there's forward refs which aren't happening here. And then there's a, is this legal? So something happened that I triggered the, is this, this is not legal. So let me go backwards here because I'm blowing up in the parser. I'm not going to do the iteration peep hack. I'm just going to look at the types here and figure out what's going on. I don't know. So this might not be one of the, it doesn't have a huge amount of tricks in it. The program is small, so I can look at every possible point where I'm going to start or stop. Um, let me look at this here. So one of the things I've added as a debugger hack is the parser object has a two string that the debugger will always pop up. And the two string prints the remaining unparsed program. So here I know that the remaining unparsed program is U8B equals 123. Okay, I'm too soon. This is the setting it to 123. I'm gonna run again. So first debugger hack, look at where you are in the parser. If you're debugging in the parser, look at where you are in the parser by looking at this two string and deciding you're at the point where things got broken in the parser. Yes, it continue. Okay, now look at the parser. B equals B plus 456. So he parsed B equals 123 while B, now he's at B equals B plus 456. So I'm at the right place because it's gonna blow up when I do this assignment. Okay. So now let me carry on here. Get a type out. Oh, there was no type because it's B equals not u int b equals, there's no type. I get a b when I look at the require ID. I look for semicolon. If you look at the parser, I've parsed the b of b equals. There's no semicolon. Instead, there's going to be an equal sign in a second. So the match on semicolon says no. Now I match on equals. He says yes. I'm going to parse an expression. OK, looking again at the parser's two string, I, I got the equals. I'm now doing this expression, b plus 456. So at this point, I'm going to suspect that my parse expression is correct and that my bug happens down below in my widening and narrowing. 
So I'm going to just step over the parse expression. This is part of my binary search. I assume this and, you know, no crash looks good. If I look at my this on my parser two string, you see it's at the comment slash slash truncate. So we ate the expression, fine. So now I have a, uh, I'm looking at, am I defining or, or redefining? And the answer is T is uh, not null, it is null, so I am just redefining. So I'm gonna look it up and get a declared type. So this I'm hoping works. And the answer is yes, the declared type is U8. Okay. Now I'm gonna ask, do I have an int float conversion because I'm looking at the type of expression. Well, what is expressions type here? Well, here's expression is a piece of IR. Every IR has a type. Here's the type. Oh, geez. 456 to 711. He took a U8 and he added 456. And so he gets this range. So new, new in chapter 14, I'm doing integer ranges for the narrowed int support. Here is an integer range. It is a non-trivial range. If I look at U8, by the way, that's just a shortcut name. The range is from min of zero to max of 255. So it's just an integer range. Internally, I pretty printed as U8. Otherwise, it would print just like this guy does as a bracket range. Okay. But the expression is not of type float. Oh, it is type integer, but T is not a type float. So I don't do a float widening, narrowing thing. Now I'm going to narrow ints to narrow ints. What's ZS mask? That's new. Okay. Here I'm going to say I've got something and I want to, let's see, how do I get more text for the program up? I want to say, are you going to need a zero or sign extend upon a, a loading a value? And he's going to come through here and say, oops, it was the case. Let's see here. It's not any of the weird ones or rounding. So now we're in the int case. This is a U8. This is a, 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 a unsigned. So the min is zero. So right now I'm going to truncate the right-hand side. I'm going to truncate him. You don't him, have a type for positive integer, right? You just have signed and unsigned? I just have signed and unsigned. Yeah, classic C. I, I'm, I'm being like stupid here on purpose. There's no, no difficult question. So there's certainly no expansion to big integer or anything like that. So I'm doing an and mask where I build the mask by uh, uh, getting, the, getting the, the upper bound of the range, putting a constant for it, running an and mask and optimizing as you go. So let's go assume that that all works and come back up here. So what did I get back? I got an and of the result to a mask of 255. My result type has been widened to an int because the and mask doesn't do anything smart with its 255. It just says, I got two non-constants. I got a non-constant result. So I have a, you know, got a, got a happy, happy integer out. All right, so going on, I'm going to put it in a variable so I can just name it shortly here. I'm going to click on the window and step forward. Okay, here we go. It's not a null pointer. It's not a forward ref type, so I don't have to do any forward ref games. So then I ask the is a question. So I'm done with my narrowing. I chopped you. But my type is an int. My narrow type is a U8 that fails the is a test. And so... I blow. And it took me 10 seconds because I'd just been adding this code once I saw it to figure it out in 20 seconds. And that wasn't that long. It took me five minutes to set up a test case. So the first thing, you know, Zemula reports, I make a test case, I run it, the test case fails, and now I'm debugging. So that, that part's pretty quick once it's found. What happened here? Well, my expectation was and masking would give me back a narrowed type and that this test would then pass. So this is a test is generically for all types. If you're typing, if you're assigning a pointer to an int or a float to an int or a float to a pointer or whatever, it pointed a person to pointer to, to cat, they'll all blow up because the is a test fails. So I don't want to get rid of this test. It's a useful test. So does that mean and masking and narrowing need to be two distinct concepts in the compiler? Well, there you go. That's a that's just a high level decision. Now I, I've basically understand the problem. What am I doing about it? And what I decided to do, and again, you could argue stupid decision or not, is that I decided that I would go without 
having an explicit uh, step where I would narrow, per se, and instead have and masking be smart and produce a narrowed type if he was given a canonical narrowing expression. So and mask of a constant where the right-hand side constant is of a particular shape, he'll return a narrowed int. That's my decision. There are other ways to do this. Without doing a, and I don't know if this works for all possible programs. It means that I automatically give you a narrow type if you've masked manually. So if you take some garbage int and you write yourself an and mask to zero x ff, you mask it to a byte, and then you store it to a byte typed variable, I'll just take it without requiring anything. Right. So so there is some freebies. I'll I'm doing deliberate things. bit fiddling. Yeah, user written bit fiddling that matches my and masking pattern will be treated as if it was an explicit narrowing cast. But I'm probably okay because it'll get widened. Yeah, if you're using it in a larger expression, it immediately just rewidens and no one cares. Like as long as I'm not doing something dumb like using a signed integer for my bit fiddling thing. No, no, I'll, I'll do those too. So Zemelia caught me twice, once for unsigned, once for signed. <laughs> I had to go and, and get the signed. Right. So that's what I'm worried about is that I'm doing some bit fiddling uh -huh. and I accidentally lose bits at the top that then get signed extended differently than they got shrunk. It, well, yeah. And if you bit fiddle and lose bits yourself and you were hoping that you would get a... So like if I and it down... And I kill a bunch of zeros. Right. And then I sign extend it back up and I fill them with ones. Right. I, I will treat you as a narrowed signed int if you do a canonical signed int opera, uh, a signed int masking, which is just a, the arithmetic shift right. Right. I, I will treat that. That sounds arithmetically valid. Right, I will treat that. It has to be the right powers of two, and then I'll treat that as if it was narrowed, and it would then be allowed to be assigned silently into an I8 byte, you know, Java signed byte. Okay. Uh, the only thing that magical here at this point was I needed to sharpen the AND guy. So here in the AND guy, I just turned this code off just for this this bug here. So if I go run this test case again, uh, I'm gonna just nuke that and run to the and mask. So I'm, I'm, I'm in here, I've produced the and mask manually. The and mask has two incoming types. He has a range, which is 123 plus 456 or whatever range of a byte plus 456 and the and mask. And the only thing I had in there at that time was if you're both constants, compute the constant. You're not both constants because one's a range. So you go to type integer bottom and then I lost the type. So I had to, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the compute call here has to be conservatively correct. It can always return bot. That's supposed to be legal everywhere. So you can do sharper, but only if you can figure it out. So instead I added this code, go run again. And here I say, okay, go get the mask from these guys. And here is, you know, the mask code just does a stupid, I didn't overflow, I didn't overflow, I do my bit fiddle. It's a horrible bit fiddling thing. It took me half an hour to fucking get the bit fiddly right. Here's my mask on the upper left, three FFF for the one, one guy. And the other guy is 255. So he just comes through with 255. That's my mask, 255. I have a mask. The mask is not invalid. So I'm going to make you a type integer make zero to mask. I'll give you a positive value, uh, an unsigned value up to the mask. So now the, the type I got out of here is U8. And if I come back up out of people, I'm in here for the second one because I have another one of these. I'll come up out of people, out of people, come up again. I'm here, I'm at the, at the truncation guy. I get my expert out. The expert's type is U8, new and improved from int. So I come through here, it's it's not an auto ref, is a, and of course they're identical. 
They're both U8s, so this passes the ISA test, so there's no error in liposome. So that debugging, the, the, the thing, the takeaway from that debugging session was use the parser to see that you're in the right spot, and then it's pretty easy to narrow down to, you know, why I hit this error. And let me get rid of, I'm in the iterator guy. Who's, I, have a, I have a question for you. Yeah. As you're walking through it, you're narrating like, oh, this does this, this does that. Right. Are you, is that like how you're talking to yourself as you're debugging as well? Or are you just sort of stepping through like, like, I guess, um, um, I find that when I'm debugging some, especially someone else's code, it's a lot of work to be able to say what any given piece of statement is doing and why it's there. Right. So oftentimes I'm not necessarily. Yeah, I certainly don't talk aloud while I'm debugging to myself. No, no, but I'm, but you know, inter internal monologue or whatever. But right. like, and are the you internal... saying like, oh, this is this is doing this, this is doing that, or you know, because like it's easy to just say, okay, this is some, I don't know what this is. Let's step over it. Right. So uh, yes, if if I am debugging somebody else's code, I'll have an internal monologue where I'm guessing what the hell they're doing, and deciding that I should or shouldn't inspect more closely any particular point or just step over. Yeah. So yeah, I have that internal monologue. After I decide and know what's going on, I start start to take bigger steps faster. This particular case, as soon as I saw the fail was in the parser at the and mask, I was suspicious. I immediately looked at the result of the masking and then knew it, knew what happened. So it was a much quicker because I don't have to put into words. Like the effort to put my thinking into words, even internal monologue, does take some effort. Yeah, so I could skip that on simple because this is a project I've been working on for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just curious, like. Uh... No, no, that's entirely fair. I was yeah. hoping to discover a a better one. Here is the empty statement fix. One of them that took me longer to narrow down. Or where did Samili had some good ones up here? Where did I find this one? The NPE with this guy. And it was something about forward references. And here is a sh another NPE. One of these wasn't this. I'm looking for a better. Sharpens narrow, clean up comments, fixed a whole lot of. Surely this is not this bug. Uh, like like I'm looking for a thing that failed in a more difficult place. And and love to go backwards and go. Diagnose where that came from. Here I'm adding the shift operators and the narrowed ints. Here's the empty statement fix that was obnoxious. Test case for all reading types pointed out I needed a rounding guy. I was missing float math things. I failed to be monotonic on places. Like, where do you want me to pull so what's out? Your, what's your process when you're dealing with a non-focused test? a non-focused bug. So you have a big yeah. blob of stuff happening. And, right. you know, if you stepped in from the beginning of a program, you'd have to step, you know, millions of times to get there. Yeah. So right. how do you narrow down? Right. Okay. So so in the land of simple, all programs are small because we don't have any writing any big things unless they come from the fuzzer. The yeah. fuzzer includes a typical reduction, a reasonably good reduction guy, occasionally it, it, it fails to reduce as much as you'd like and you get some horrific things. Um, one of these before long came in, what, what, wasn't here then. I have, I have one of these horrific giant things as one of the fuzzer tests, it's not gonna be here then that we never found a shorter test case for you. Here we go. Here, this. This is the reduced test case. 
Mm-hmm. Wow, minus, 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 arg, wow, blah, 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 holy crap, what happened? Fail. Okay. Um, the, 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 this test, I don't remember what the bug was for it. Let's go run it. Get rid of all my, my breakpoints. Okay, it works. The, the main place this kind of test fails is in iter peeps, for which I usually fail, uh, Yeah. So okay. So so where iter peeps usually fails is I'm running progress on work list, which gives me a fully in squared assert. So it's an expensive assert, and the assert says shit like walk everybody, stop from start from the stop, and walk the entire program with a lambda function that says if you're on the work list, I don't care. If you're not, can I do something with you? If I can't, that's great. If I can do something, you should have been on the work list and you weren't. So I set a break point here. Break here for bug. And then we get in and get out. And the mid assert thing is a place where I'd say a uh, bunch of people who would make side effects stop making side effects and report that they would make progress, but they don't actually do anything. So the, the assert here is a common one that says I had a distant fail from a people. I, I made a people that stepped a couple layers. Uh, I didn't put the dependencies a couple layers out. I changed something over here the, or in the layer in the middle. And now I could make this change if I were to check it, but I didn't get it on the work list because he wasn't a neighbor. So that's a commonly more difficult thing. For that one, the iterate guy is just running a loop. Now, if you look at the count, it's unused. And that's because it's a debug only variable. That is the number of times I work the work list. The work list is pseudo random. Pseudo meaning it's deterministic, which means it repeats every time, which means I can use the count to either stop at a particular count or to binary search. So this is a common hack here where I, I run for a while and then I, I, I uh, get my assert triggered. I find the count. I break right before the count. I start looking at what's going on. And at this point, I, I can do things like, hey, How's my program look? And the answer is, for this case, the program is just too big to do something useful with. Here, it's scrolling on and on and on and on. This is the dump of the current IR. So it's giant, it's huge, a full dump of the IR. You see no numbers are approaching 1800s here. It's not useful to try and look at this and figure out what happened. And instead, it's it's useful to look at the single thing that I'm updating and then figure out why it can update, why the people, the debugger here, down here, break here for bug, can do it, and I couldn't. And that one happens because I stop at the count above where the issue happens. Then when I do the people progress, I set my breakpoint in here on the node in question. I say, oh, I failed because I make progress on this node. What progress did he make? I asked that question. Now it is, oh, you can make this progress. Why weren't you on the dependency list? Always it's this people I'm doing. He should have an add depth that says, hey, do something useful here. So let me go, let me go, instead of doing count here, let me just go the next time I can make progress. I will show up here and see if we can figure out what happened. Okay, so I ran on to count 106. I have a loop happened. I don't know what he did, but he's claiming some kind of progress. So I'm going to look at his type here. It said at control, that's reasonable. His inputs have one input, but not a back edge. Okay, so this is a loop that's reachable from the top, but no, has no back edge. That means that somebody figured out that you can't loop backwards in, into this loop. This loop is a, a fall into, but never, no trip back, which means he's going to disappear as a non-merge point in a minute. Um, his outputs have already been trimmed. He's got a single control, no fees. It's a junk merge point because the, the program is ludicrous and had all these junk tests that can never, the while loop can never let you trip. So you fall in, but you never trip backwards. Okay. So he's going to clean that up in a minute. 
but that's that's the kind of thing I'm looking for here. Uh, I fail my assert. I go backwards to the count using the count to tell me which peephole did it. And then I can go ask, why did this peephole trigger the assert by single stepping through the peephole, generally discovering I needed an add depth. So I don't know if, you know, I have no bug here, so I don't know if I'm going to find something useful. Yeah. So one of the problems that I run into when I'm doing this is that I've got a few breakpoints that might be useful and they're generally like not the simplest breakpoints. They've got various conditions attached to them. And then I, but then I want to exit so that I need to like disable all the breakpoints. And it's just like, I find the workload, the workflow very like arduous. Like, Okay. So, so you and I have very different workflows for the closure versus Java. This this thing that I just did there, uh, going through the iterate and stopping, comes pretty quick. Like yeah. you saw, it was a big ass program. Snap like that, nothing to it. Yeah. Um, if I go ask the question, you know, how big is count get here? There, it's thousand. I, I run through the work list basically once per node doing things a little bit more. So I get a thousand trips through the work list. Yeah. That's mostly instant. So it really is, even with this n squared assert, it's mostly instant. So that's a thousand guys, a thousand times over, I asked every one of them. So I did a few million tests of peoples. Yeah. Bigger programs, again, in C2 land, it was all instant. Uh, I, I would have counts in the tens of thousands, occasionally to the hundreds of thousands, but not beyond all, mm. you know, that was C code, it was all instant. Mm. Um, th so one thing was having the trip be really quick because my, my peeps are faster than your pattern matcher by an interesting amount. So maybe that's an issue. Testing yeah. every go, I can remove this n squared assert and I have tried it in the past when we're doing like really big, buzzer tests that are very large. Uh, we go ahead and remove the n squared assert and then it runs a lot faster and you're looking for crashes that come later. There's a there's another, this test is also checked later, this progress on list at the end of iter peeps um, or it had been iter peeps type check. Does type check catch it? Somebody catches it if you screw up. I wonder, I wonder if I had it and I lost it. I should have this test at the end of iter peeps. Um, and then that, then I can get rid of the n squared and just get a, a linear pass to check everyone who could do anything, did something, and then they're done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, so I, another I, I, failure. Performance, it's not a performance issue that I find arduous. It's like, it's basically instant, I think, to get to where I need to get in the program. The, the problem more for me, the challenge that I find is that there's there tends to be a lot of having to sort of fiddle around with the uh, debugger. Um, and so turning on and off breakpoints and then forgetting to turn the right ones back on and sort of doing right. I, I I find that I just have to I don't know. I, I find that I it takes me a long time if I'm if I as soon as I use the debugger, I'm looking at two orders of magnitude slower for debugging my problems. Right. Uh, I said, I, my... I, in the past, I have gone through and made my life easy in the debugger on purpose. Yeah. So I look at my workflow in the debugger and ask that question. What am I doing yeah. here? Why no is problem. it so screwed around? So I have these special places like break here for bug. Right. Right. Yeah. I, and, you know, AA has a similar spot where he catches monotonicity fail, failures for forge and backwards flows and upward and downward flows. And he has idealized not on work list failures. I'll, I'll break here. Right. And I arrange an AA, not here, that if I simply uh, uh, pop frames in the debugger using, you know, standard Java IntelliJ pop frames, I can get right back to where I was, two pop frames, I can start single stepping forward and rerun the failure. The failure had no side effects. The failure was detected without side effects, halted the debugger. Now I can pop frames and rerun and see the failure live action immediately. That took some engineering, totally worth it. Uh-huh, so, so that pop frames means that you're not actually restarting the program, you're backing up the program? That's, that's correct. 
prop frames says throw away the current execution frame and everything it had it, it can't undo stores to memory so the trick is to have the test that says you're failing not have any side effects so that you can rerun it a thousand times over and, and debug it again and again and again without any side effects. So in mm. particular, if I go look at people compute set type, what really happens here is I've got a new type for a node. I didn't put it anywhere. It's just in a register. It's just in a local variable. I have an old type for a node. I do an is a test. If you fail, then you get this at all and go ever in AA, I do that test along with a bunch of others before I begin doing any assignments to things. Yeah, yeah. I remember we made that change when we were looking at some of my stuff too. Right, and the, the goal of that one is to so I can debug, halt and say I have failed instead of assigning, you know, uh, type to type here, instead of an assignment, I hit the, the assert and now I'm going to uh, well, here, I'll hit this assert. So I blow this assert, haven't assigned anything. From this assert point in the debugger, I pop frame out of set type. Gets me back to, whoops, not here. Well, whatever set type went to, fuck it. <laughs> Wrong uphill. It's my mental uphill, not where the debugger is actually going uphill. I get back to where I'm at this call to compute. Now I can look at the old value of the node, and I can single step the compute and see the new value for the node. And they say, why are these out of order? What happened here? Yeah. Sometimes the compute here is wrong. Sometimes I got that node set typed too, or, uh, too eagerly the wrong way and was lifting it back to something sensible, but it went the wrong way to do so. So sometimes yeah. I want to say the compute on the spot did the wrong thing. I can just see it. And sometimes it was set earlier to a wrong thing. And I do that by going into set type and saying, if you're setting the type for this node, break. So go back to set type. It was already out of order. So the, the reasonable computation here failed this assert because the old value was bad. So instead, yeah. I'm going to get back to the old value by putting a breakpoint here and saying, when you're on this node, stop and see it. And you'll watch it go from bottom, get lifted to integer, got lifted to top or whatever stupid thing went too far. And then you say, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Now you have that compute call and you can see where your different compute calls are not monotonic. So basically what it is, is detecting that a node's compute call is not monotonic. And it lets me catch it either side of that monotonic fail. Yeah. Hmm. So these are things that I mentally put into the my debug process on purpose because these are common fails and I yeah. make them quick to debug. Quick yeah. to catch, quick to debug. But I engineer and there's some, some time into some, it. Some basic, yeah. So basically there's some basic effort that you have to put in when you're coming into a situation, right? You're you're putting in some tooling like uh you know pure function pure you know make make some of the stuff pure function so that you can debug that function where you've got chance for higher chance for bugs right um you're also typically trying to it seems like you try and put a decent amount of effort into narrowing the test in the first place and then you've got some sort of pre allocated or sort of pre-marked places where you're saying here's a here's a place to that's probably a good place for a breakpoint yeah yeah all, all of these things all at once if yeah. the test fails easily i don't care how big it is if it's obvious i'm done i'll go fix it yeah. and walk away if it's big and being difficult try to reduce okay now having done reduced i'm back into is the reduced program easier to debug how do I make life easier? This goes to standard philosophy of, of programmers, should be programmers everywhere, which is watch daily actions you do on a regular basis and optimize your workflow. Yeah. If you're yeah. avoiding the debugger because it's painful, maybe the real answer is to make it not painful. And why is the debugger painful for you? Okay. I don't know. I, I have my suspicions because of the way Clojure works with IntelliJ and Java's yeah, so I would never use the debugger when I'm doing closure stuff. Like I have the um, recording de debugger, so I I've got something where I can just sort of jump back and forth and look at everything that's happening in a recording. Right. And um, I find that very very effective. So it's very quick to sort of hone in on the spot that I'm interested in. 
Uh, and then I'm doing things generally immutable. So that sort of similar idea of just like, right. It's fine. I, I also add some things. So, so for instance, you know, you talked about having that, um, that expensive assert. I, I have that as well. Um, one thing that I also do is on every, um, successful people finishing i actually clone the entire graph <laughs> so <laughs> i i have this linked list of graph clones that i can go back to and i can actually go back and say oh um four graphs four peoples earlier here's how the graph looked and query that a bit or even restore that to be the current and mess around with it if i need to i find that to be sometimes useful and then sometimes i can use that to say like diff like, wait, why, like what changed in the graph? Like, Right. So I don't keep that. There is a history for very large programs in C2, never in simple, that history would have been useful from time to time. Usually yeah, useful, but... I can deduce where, you know, which, which kind of thing was doing the change and start setting breakpoints. This is back, you know, C2 20 years ago. Yeah. and go debug that way. Um, on the other hand, if cloning the entire program adds to your debugging runtime significantly, which I don't know that it does, but that is a thing that like, I have that assert that I can turn on or off that's N squared. There yeah. are times when I'll turn it off because I want to go faster. Yeah, I can turn off the cloning and also the asserting as well. So, but I normally, it, normally it doesn't affect me. It's pretty fast. I can run my entire test suite in a second or right. two. Right, yeah, you have mostly small yeah. tests. Yeah, it's still small. So once it gets bigger, I might turn more things off. But I actually found that the cloning uh, to be extremely useful in the first time I was building a C of Nodes compiler uh, because okay. I was more often more confused. Yeah, that makes sense. And now I don't look at it nearly as often. Right. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, other tricks here, there are regions. If I touch the, if I touch the, 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 the type system, I immediately go and double check that the, which standard test, but double check that the, that the test type assert works. And that's one where you need to have it. I know you do. But this is specific to like C of nodes here, test lattice theory. Yeah. This, I, I heavily rely on theoretical properties of the lattice. I know there are people who on Discord, who may watch this thing here, are curious about why these properties and what they mean, what the hell's going on. I want these properties to have some useful behaviors that give me good theoretical results out of the standard work list without any effort, but it's not obvious why or that they're actually there. So the, the, the buzzword list here, symmetric, complete, bounded, ranked lattice. Um, this means things like there's a dual, so you're symmetric and you can compute join from meet. So I don't have to do a meet and a join, I just do a meet. The meet operator is the thing that happens on fee functions and the join happens on casts. You need both of them. Uh, you want the meet to be commutative and associative. It generally is, um, but you want to force check that. That means that I can hand things in the, uh, in the work list in any order, and I don't care about the order of the work list. So the work list is pseudo random, okay? Uh, complete means if I'm in the lattice, I'm in the lattice when I do meet and join, and that means I don't escape the lattice when I do meets and joins. I think I'm getting the terminology right here. I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Bounded here means there's a limited size. It's not an infinite lattice. That means you can't fall or rise in the lattice an infinite amount of times, which means you terminate in the size of programs times depth of lattice. N times K, where K is the lattice depth. Lattice depth is usually like three or something. It's really tiny. So you're guaranteed the hard termination rules and any order of the work list. Um, the, the symmetry test here, if A is a B, then A join C is a B join C, means that I don't get partial knowledge, whichever order I, I walk the work list. So if I have two sets of transformations, one for taking a step here and then a step, and I step here and step here, 
You'll hear me call this the church roster one step property. It doesn't matter which order I take these steps, I'm guaranteed to get to the same spot in the end. And that goes hand in hand with the work list can be visited in random order. I'll get the same answer every time. So you want these fun properties. If I touch the type system, I'm checking this test specifically. Yeah, I actually built that test to run during my test suite every time. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, quite expensive because it goes exponential on the number of types. So as the number of types gets more, this was getting to be hundreds of thousands and then even more tests. Okay. So, and so what I, what I did is I just said, okay, I normally, I want this to run periodically, but, uh, it actually works pretty well. I have it, uh, that I do, uh, I put all the types in an array. I do a shuffle and I grab, uh, like, um, a couple hundred or something enough that there's, uh, just a, uh, sub second amount of tests. Yeah, this, it's all this, combinatorial. This and then test I is not, it's not exponential for me. Uh, well, any given pair isn't, but you have like, you can test all pairs against each other, right? Well, or that all... would make you quadratic. And in fact, I'm cubic right here, but I'm not exponential. Right. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so it would be uh, cubic. Okay. So, okay. Now, so I just grab a small subset of, okay. and then test them all against each other. Right. But then here's, every time I run, it's random subset. So I get good coverage as long as I run the test reasonably. Here's well. my so subset gather gathering. Thing. Field gather, type integer gather, float gather, blah, 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 blah. Gather, gather, gather. Throw them all yeah. together. One of the things I will do is I will I will uh, a duel already, which I'll, I'll complain at you if you hand me a low versus a high. So I get a double of whatever I see here, but I, I guarantee one each side of the thing. And then if I go gather, a sample gather guy, he doesn't give all possible integers. I grab because no. there's you know four billion or two to the sixty-four, or whatever. So I grab some samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I do the same, but it still became uh, enough that it was doing. Okay. I don't know hundreds uh, of thousands. Actually, it, you know, it wasn't so much the test time. It was my test tool wasn't able to handle that many asserts, and it was starting to slow down the testing tool. <laughs> Well, okay, so the reason I'm asking, because my, my list is size 42. Right. It's not it's not vast beyond reason by any means. Here yeah. they are, bottom control, field of zero, integer zero bool, float, pi, memory. Here's some pointers to structs. Let's see if I can widen this out here a little bit. Just kind of see I've got, uh, you know, struck with a field a int and a s2 field pointing on s2 and so on and so forth so I, I take some random samplings from each of the different domains but i don't get like AA. this comes up to like 130 but i do not get yeah. thousands or tens of thousands yeah i just checked i yeah actually i've got 52 types okay listed here but i actually uh shuffle it and take 15 of them so and that gives I'm, me I'm, okay a, like, well about several thousand uh actual assertions being run why so then, well, no, the, the, okay why does assertion count matter here so here's my list of 40 i think it's my test tool oh okay so this is just a standard java j unit test here run. yeah I'm, well, I'm using a different test suite and it comes it produces like a separate unit test for every like oh combination no, I just make this as one unit test, so it's instant, right. so I test them all. Okay. Because it rarely fails. If I change the type system and I get a failure here, then I'm in here with paying attention. And there are techniques you use in this WAD to go make your life easier. Um, if yeah. you're having trouble figuring out, like, one of the symmetry tests looks weird or something, this this guy is an obvious, this is kind of bizarre. Um, yeah. But no, make it one single... Yeah, there's asserts all over, but each one is, you know, half of these are cubic. So you yeah. get you get this assert same cubic count of 50. Yeah. Fine. I don't know. Definitely I don't get to tens of thousands or anything like that. This is one of the instant things. Yeah. Um, what else? Check there if I'm touching types. The other tests all fall out when I get a good test case. Um, and then, you know, 
binary search and the iter peeps is the other obvious place you hit things that are slow and difficult, would otherwise be slow and difficult without this. The iter peeps hack where I have this breakpoint that I set progress on list. And I, I have the, I don't do any side effects unless I'm going to uh, uh, fail first. That's in the, like the, the people ops for the set type here. You blow this assert before you actually sign. Um, that's also, I can repeat and rerun go up in the debugger and go back down in and see what the hell happened. Uh, those are all sort of hard lessons. I didn't start that way in C2, but I, I got that way. All right. Other than a more fancy debug session where I figure out a better place, like I, I unwind one of my more exciting bug fixes and then go forward. I don't, I don't have one ready to go. So I'm, I'm, I'll declare done. Whatever. Here it goes. Boom. Yeah. Anything else? If not, I'm probably going to go put my shorts on and walk in the driveway with a hose and go after my my dusty gear. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, and and maybe next time I'll have more pictures. Like I said, I have some. Lisa took some really cool pictures, so we have a lot more pictures. It's a good a good time was had by all, despite diverticulitis and cracked ribs and all kinds of other crazy things. Fine. All right. Till we meet again. Bye. 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 Bye.